Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Susan Zybel, and I have the pleasure of serving as the president of the Trinity Club of Hartford. Tonight kicks off our 2024 speaker series, and we want to thank our partnership with the Office of Alumni Relations to be able to bring you a great evening of discussion and learning. I'm pleased to introduce to you TCOH Vice President, Chair of the Speaker Series, and tonight's moderator, Matt Smith, class of 1982 and parent of 2019. Matt. Thank you, Sue. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Our talk will be followed by a question answer session, so please type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. The Trinity Club of Hartford Speaker Series is dedicated to educating members of the Trinity College community about issues central to Trinity's vitality. The objective of the series is to provide an honest view of an issue from an informed perspective. Tonight, we will discuss why Trinity is becoming a powerhouse in the world of urban studies. Trinity College has a significant competitive edge in attracting high caliber students by being one of the few elite schools located in a capital city. Of the 11 NESCAC schools, Trinity is the only one located in a city. Based on these facts, the vitality of Trinity College and Hartford are deeply connected. Urban studies at Trinity College is an important support of that vitality. Garth Myers, the Paul E. Rayther Distinguished Professor of Urban International Studies and Director of the Center for Urban and Global Studies, is with us tonight to present how he has, the center has evolved and fulfills its mission to play a critical role in advancing Trinity's urban and global education on campus, in Hartford and across the world. Through faculty and student research and outreach initiatives, the center is a central conduit for student engagement to learn and transform the urban world of the 21st century, beginning in Hartford and expanding nationally and globally. Joining Garth is Stan Marcus, class of 1963. Stan and his wife, Rosemary, have established a fellowship in the Urban Studies program run by Trinity Center for Urban and Global Studies. Stan's support for the center grew from his extensive work in law and government. After earning his BA at Trinity, Stan was named a Marshall Scholar and received a master's in 1965 from Cambridge University. In 1968, he graduated from Harvard Law School with a JD. He practiced law and worked in the US Department of Housing and Urban Development in Washington, DC. He has been a committee staff director in the US Senate the Senior Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce, as well as Senior Fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government 2016-2017. He brings a perspective that integrates legal, business, and urban experiences. Before we hear from Garth and Stan, just a reminder to the audience to type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So, Garth, to begin our discussion, please describe how Trinity Center for Urban and Global Studies has evolved. What transformation has occurred and how did it come about? Thank you, Matt. Um, I uh, begin by saying we, we call the Center for Urban and Global Studies CUGS. It's, a, it's an odd sounding word, but that makes it easier to talk about it in that sense. And CUGS has been around for 17 years. Uh, my predecessor as director, Dr. Xiangming Chen, who's on leave this year, um, was a part of creating uh, CUGS in, uh, in 2000, opened in October of 2007. And um, a few years later, I was hired to, to Trinity. It came in 2011. And Xiongming and I put together a proposal to create an urban studies major and program, um, which began, uh, was approved and began in 2013. So the first class of undergraduates who majored in urban studies in, the, in its modern iteration, because there was an earlier urban, urban and environmental studies program in the 1970s and 80s, um, but our modern urban studies program, uh, first class, graduated in 2014. So we're now uh, looking forward to our 11th cohort of students graduating. Uh, so the biggest transformation of, uh, of COGS in its history has been in the creation of the urban studies program. Uh, over the last few years, we've been building towards having um, a master's program in urban studies um, that's focused on urban planning. We have a graduate certificate that began in 2020 uh, in within the public policy master's program and just started uh, the master's of urban planning program as well. Um, it's a thriving program and we have uh, we have grown to be one of the top 12 majors at the depart at the at the college level. Um, and uh, our department faculty is continues to grow. 
Um, and it's, it's a very exciting time to be in urban studies um, because of the challenges that we face here in Hartford, but also across the, the rest of Connecticut, across the country. And as you said, um, through the world, because uh, one of our core courses from the beginning has been, uh, it's entitled From Hartford to World Cities. And so, as you stated, we start uh, from Hartford and we build outwards um, to the Garth, to Garth, can I add? global global context. Sure, Stan. Yeah, can I ask you a question? <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm very interested in, in what Trinity as a liberal arts institution brings to the urban studies program. What's an urban studies program doing in a small liberal arts college in, in New England like Trinity? What, a, what do you a, get from being part of that institution? It's a, it's a great question and it is, um, it's a rare context because there are in the US News and World Report, they classify Trinity as a national uh, liberal arts college. And of those national liberal arts colleges, there are only 12 that have uh, either a major or a minor in urban studies within our league, within NESCAC, uh, Bowdoin has a minor that just started in urban studies, but none of the other programs have a minor or a major. Tufts, of course, is quite famous for uh, its graduate program in urban planning, um, but it has no undergraduate major. Um, so it is a rare thing. And um, I think part of what I would say is that our context of being in a city uh, makes us unique, not just in um, in the context of New England, but across the country. A lot of liberal arts colleges are in leafy suburbs or in the outskirts uh, or in rural areas. Um, and we have this unique opportunity uh, to learn from Hartford, to uh, build our connections uh, with Hartford, and to use Hartford as a springboard for understanding uh, cities around the world. But within the liberal arts context, I think what's important to recognize is that uh, urban studies is an interdisciplinary field, and uh, it takes from and contributes to uh, fields in the natural sciences, in math, in the humanities, in the social sciences, and, uh, and in the arts. And we have, um, over the course of our 11 years, uh, we've had a, about 200, that's 202 people who registered for the urban studies major. And out of those, uh, 80 of them have double majored. And the range of fields, Stan, that they double major in is, is staggering. It's, you know, math and computer science all the way over to studio arts. Um, that's and, what strikes me as, as being a, a, such an important part. Yeah. Because as I understand the way things are, are working with, uh, with with you at, at Trinity in the department, um, people are with all kinds of different majors um, right. participate in either uh, they either major in urban studies, but if they don't, there are people who bring mathematics and statistical analysis and data analysis and history and architecture and so forth to urban studies. Yeah. And I, th I just happen to think that is vitally important because after all, what is urban studies all about, right? It's about cities. Yeah. And what cities all about? Well, they're about all kinds of things. They're about That's architecture. Right. Uh, they're about providing services. They're about culture. They're about educational institutions. They're about the experience of living yeah. in an environment that is enriching, that provides opportunities that are not otherwise available in, in an environment in which there isn't that kind of diversity and that kind of interaction. And as, as I sort of look at what what you're doing in, in your department, um, it seems to me you are sort of embodying that notion that this is a very, very complex subject that it draws upon all kinds of disciplines and different interests mm -hmm. in order to produce a perspective that is relevant to what city living is all about. Yeah, I think that's absolutely it. And, um, you know, our country, about 80% of the population lives in metropolitan areas. And so any graduate of Trinity College is, you know, 80% of the time, they're going to be living in a city. And so they they may do something else for a living, um, but understanding the, the metropolitan area they're in is going to be an important part of their lives. So it's valuable uh, to take an urban studies class, even if you're, you're a physics major or what have you. 
And um, I feel like uh, when I hear from our, our alums, since we now have a you know a cohort of 10 years of, of alums of urban studies, um, they're often telling me that they're so glad that they studied urban studies, even though they're in finance or real estate or law uh, or public policy as a career, um, because their urban studies degree gave them that lens that included uh, a broad range of liberal arts approaches and that their Regardless. employers, their employers recognize that. And yeah, um, yeah, I think that's very important. So what is, what is the career path for an urban studies major from Trinity? Typically, where do these people go? Where do they, as far as you know, hope to go? What, what do they hope to do? Right. That's a good question. I think most of them have uh, have gone into um, an urban career, but I would say probably the largest contingent of, have gone into real estate and property management. Um, a second group goes into finance, but within the sphere, uh, their, their interests are in the urban sphere. So they may be working with a large uh, financial firm or a bank, but they're, they're expertise is recognized within that um, in terms of uh, urban studies. Um, we have a growing number of students who are going to graduate school and the range of, of types of schools they go to, I would say um, the three biggest categories are law, public policy, and urban planning. Um, and because it's Trinity, we're, 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 we're small but mighty, I like to say, and um, as a rare thing to have a, a, a highly ranked National Liberal Arts College with an urban studies degree, if you get your degree from Trinity in urban studies, um, you're going to be looked at quite carefully by uh, those graduate programs and especially in, in, in urban planning. Um, and so we've, we've had students who've gone to the top programs uh, in the country and some internationally um, in the UK and Germany over the last few years. Um, and, and I think they'll become leaders in the, in the field uh, over time because we have attracted um, uh, consistently a, a number of really top students at Trinity um, to urban studies. The, uh, one of the things that was said about this program in, in inviting people uh, to uh, listen to us and to participate was that um, was that uh, Trinity is a powerhouse in <laughs> urban studies. Yeah. I believe that to be true. But I do I, too. I, 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 would, <laughs> I, would, I would like your perspective on what it, what it takes to be a powerhouse. What, 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 is, what, is, what is Trinity looking for to be a powerhouse in the field? What are you looking for to be a, a powerhouse? And, and what do you have to do to continue to be a powerhouse and, and to grow as a powerhouse? That's a good set of questions. And uh, I'll start with the, the first. As I said, we're, we're small but mighty. I don't think you can say that we're a powerhouse in comparison to, uh, to Graduate School of Design at Harvard or, uh, or MIT, uh, but we, we can aspire to be such. And um, I think part of it is, again, our, our location, our connectivity um, to not just to a city, but to the state capital um, in a in a state that has 169 towns and every town has an urban planning office. And so uh, part of our route to being a powerhouse or to become a powerhouse is very much connected to uh, the city of Hartford and all of the cities and towns of Connecticut. Um, so one of the things that I've done in um, it's a class that just started last fall, but it's it's a core class, a required class for the, the new master's in urban planning, but it's also a key class. About half of the students in the class were undergraduate urban studies majors. We call it a global studio. Um, and it I literally took that path going from Hartford out uh, to the world. Um, but as uh, is often the case at, at larger schools like uh, MIT or Pennsylvania or, or, or Harvard, um, urban planning programs have, have a studio. So I said, okay, we'll have a studio, but we'll have it as a studio that's a, that's a Connecticut kind of studio. And so I didn't just uh, stop with Hartford. I had uh, planners from, from New Britain and Waterbury and Ridgefield, um, since out of those 169 towns, most of them are not big cities. 
um, and they still have planning issues. Um, and had the, the planners uh, coming from those uh, communities, and in the case of, of New Britain, we rode the CT fast track to New Britain and, and met the director of urban planning and um, the uh, director of economic development for New Britain, who took us around their, their, their city and showed us uh, the developments that have been happening. Um, and um, we set projects for the students to work on in teams. Um, who knows what will happen with them, but I know that the folks in Ridgefield are gonna be coming back uh, again to, to that global studio and we'll continue that relationship very strongly. And I hope also with New Britain and Waterbury. Um, and then we can have uh, our students go out into the state. Uh, and eventually, of course, when we have a good number of urban studies majors who then become urban planners in the in the master's program, they can work for those towns um, because there's a huge demand. Um, and again, having the urban studies degree with a liberal arts background means you're not just getting a technician. You're not just getting somebody who knows how to do geographic information systems and knows the laws and rules and what have you. But you're able to, to say, this is a smart person who can think outside the box. And, yeah, I, and I, I think that people are seeing that already. Um, I, I want to interject. You, you mentioned um, uh, urban planners. Right. I want to interject a, a, a personal note here. Matt's father-in-law uh -huh. um, was a very prominent urban planner, Richard Carpenter. Okay, and sure. Yeah. Matt's wife, um, Ellen, yes. is the daughter of uh, Richard Dick Carpenter. And uh, I met uh, Dick a long, long time ago, um, he, as, as, as long ago as when I was a senior in high school. He was about 10 years older than I. Um, and I, his love of cities yeah. is his enthusiasm for cities, his appreciation of the complexity uh, of cities uh, had a very, very a great uh, in, impact on me. He was the uh, head mm. of the regional planning for Southwestern Connecticut. Okay. As you, yeah. as, you can, as you can imagine, a very difficult area in yeah. which to be a city planner because of all of the sort of um, sort of not my backyard kinds of uh, in environments that exist yep. in that. Uh, yeah, and he, um, and well, you mentioned, you know, 169, you know, municipalities in Connecticut, and each one has a planning office. Right. Um, you know, and that was Dick's challenge was in an area of Connecticut that was developing very rapidly. Um, and where, you know, I mean, having lived in Fairfield County for a number of years myself, I know the infrastructure is, is, uh, is always a challenge. Right. Um, you know, right. he, um, at least he was with a, uh, in an organization, um, again, as Stan says, Southwestern Regional Planning, that I think encompassed about seven of those municipalities. So there was some coordination of yeah. how, uh, you know, the area was growing and lost the appropriate infrastructure, not just from travel, you know, certainly rail and, uh, you know, I-95, but um, just, you know, infrastructure from, uh, you know, standpoint of uh, utilities, uh, standpoint of, um, you know, the, the, you know, water that you need for all those folks. I mean, it was, it got into some very, very basic issues that he was grappling with um, that went with the yeah. development. Um, and that it just prompted a question. The question that it prompted was, are, are, are the, the students who are engaging with these 169 municipalities, are they finding similar issues? Is every place got its own issues? Um, and how is the Urban Studies Center able to, um, you know, work with that? That's a great question. I think uh, what you were talking about earlier is quite relevant in what your, your, your father-in-law was working on. Um, and that is that I, I come from uh, my, my PhD is in geography, but I took uh, between my master's and PhD, I took more coursework in the uh, Graduate School of Architecture and Urban Planning as it was then at UCLA, um, which was in the heyday of what is called the, the Los Angeles School of, of Urban Studies. And um, part of that legacy is to be um, very strongly linked to uh, a, a community engagement and activism. And another part of that legacy is um, advocacy for metropolitan planning. Um, and that's the biggest shortcoming that we have in this state, uh, to be frank. Um, the elimination of county government is a part of it. 
um, and the the lack of empowerment of uh, these metropolitan bodies um, and and councils of government for uh, for having teeth to to enact plans, because when you mention things like infrastructure, there's no way to plan infrastructure for a metropolitan area, town by town by town by town, and. So we see that very clearly, you know, we in this greater Hartford area, most of uh, the, the larger towns that border Hartford, you're paying something called the Metropolitan District uh, for your water and sewerage. And so the, the pipes literally connecting these cities, um, you know, this is infrastructure led development. Um, and so I think we need we need to have a serious conversation um, about how to enact this kind of, of metropolitan planning because the places that are able to do it um, are the most successful. And I often will teach about a, a city that I uh, have only ever really studied, but I've traveled to a few times in the last few years, which is Indianapolis, which has a, a consolidated city county government. Uh, and another city where I close to where I lived for a long time, um, uh, Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, which was forced uh, for economic circumstances to consolidate its government with Wyandotte County. Um, and the the results for those two uh, um, city county situations of this kind of consolidation of planning beyond simply one little city are are really staggering. Um, and I think you know people are beginning to see this Kansas City, Missouri is the big city, and that's where the chiefs play, blah, 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 blah. But it's it's in the outskirts of Kansas City, Kansas, where you have these major developments that have taken place in the sports world. Uh, the the new uh, National Women's Soccer League team in Kansas City that has its own team, um, has its own stadium now on the Kansas side. Um, the the national headquarters for training and planning uh, in, in in soccer are in Kansas City. Uh, huge uh, retail development. Uh, a speedway, all of these things happen because of that that metropolitan capacity for planning. Um, and so we need sure. to have conversation about that in, in New England, not just in Connecticut. Garth, um, urban planning is different from urban studies. Yes. I think, right? Yes, absolutely. And, and, and so your program is 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 different. In in what ways is it different? And what what should uh, uh, people's expectations be about urban studies as compared to urban planning? Well, I would say I wanted to say one of your influences, Stan, has been you know it's, has been uh, indirectly kind of causing a conversation here in this building um, to um, to refocus our undergraduate major to develop two concentrations. So we have core classes everybody takes, um, and then we have electives that everybody takes and a, and a methods class uh, or a variety of methods classes. One, one student have to take one of them. Uh, but then we have this concentration and we, we divided the concentration uh, element into two parts. And one of those is what we call planning and policy. So students will take four classes that cohere that are in um, the sphere of planning and policy. The other we call uh, urban society. And I joke with students when I do, this is, we're coming up on advising week. And so students, smarter students know how busy I am. So they've already been coming to see me the week before advising week, because they know I don't have enough time to meet with all of my advisees during advising week. Um, and in the, I joke with them that urban society really isn't a concentration. Um, but within it, what we do is uh, those are the students who are in the liberal arts and that are really uh, often double majors and they can count three of the classes in their other major uh, towards the urban studies major. So say the biggest uh, number of uh, joint uh, double majors is with economics. And so they'll take a seminar in urban economics. They'll take uh, economics of urban growth and they'll take um, a, another course that's called um, urban economics. So, you know, three classes, and then they'll take something like urban politics. Um, so that they're, they're uh, coming at uh, the, the idea of urban society in very different ways. Um, a lot of our students, because it's in the Center for Urban and Global Studies, 
a lot of our students that do urban society are double majors with international studies, or they just simply um, get the, the bug for urban studies because they go on study abroad uh, to, to Rome or Barcelona or, or Vienna or what have you. And, um, and they really want to kick in uh, some understanding of cities in the rest of the world. Um, yeah. And so that, yeah. you know, you know, that kind of yeah, thing that, is the urban society concentration. Um, so, so we get at both of them. And, yeah. and there are, there, I just want to finish this thought because there are students who, who struggle with that and they, they take a class and they really like uh, the, the planning and policy angle, um, but they've run out of time. So they end up graduating with urban society, but then they end up going uh, to graduate school in urban planning so that they can get more of that. You know, one well, of the no, things um, that, that was great, you know, brought that up. I don't know if you saw Jean Miley's uh, question. Uh, Jean just shared that she graduated uh, with a major in urban studies in 1973. Andrew Gold and Ivan Backer were yeah. the critical staff um, in the program. Uh, she was one of the four students uh, who spent a summer developing the major. Um, and her question was basically, has that major been discontinued? Yeah, that major that major was discontinued in 1991, I believe. Um, I mean, it was it was disbanded earlier, but there were some students who finished it uh, during that time. But um, in the process of, of of relaunching urban studies, it was a, it was called urban and environmental studies. And when they disbanded it, uh, that's when the environmental sciences program was started. And the urban dimensions, Andrew Gold had left, but the the uh, urban dimensions of that old major uh, went into public policy. And so um, as uh, Xiangming Chen and I created the urban studies major in, the, in, the, in its new iteration, those two programs, uh, environmental science and public policy were our strongest allies. And, um, and the first place we went to sort of build and get, get ideas. Um, but in the years uh, since I've, I've met and um, had correspondence with uh, a number of students who majored in urban studies during that 1973 to um, 1991 period, including some, some terrific people who've gone on to magnificent careers in um, urban studies and property development. Just uh, in that global studio, one of my guests was uh, Oliver Carr, uh, who graduated, I think, around 1986. And uh, Oliver came and talked to the students about his projects in, um, in DC and, and in Boston. Um, so we, you know, we've 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 tried to to work with um, the past, and uh, and I've found so many of the graduates, uh, like our questioner, are really excited and happy to hear that you know this has come back and want to want to contribute to to building it, and it's 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 a thrill to me to to meet alums that have that background um, and have gone on to you know careers in in urban studies and the idea that you know we can bring alums back to talk uh, to, uh, to our students now, uh, is, is just terrific. Matt, just a short, short digression. I see a question here, uh, from, a Mr. Barton, I think, uh, asking whether the Richard Carpenter we talked about before your father-in-law was the same Richard Carpenter who, who, uh, published the uh, railroad Atlas series that's that has been uh, published by Johns Hopkins. And the answer to that is yes, it is a wonderful series and uh, well-reviewed by the New Yorker uh, magazine a couple of years ago. And it's, it's absolutely wonderful for anyone yeah. who's um, interested in, in uh, the history of railroad transportation in the United States. And oh, what I, a, a direct quote from actually, I, I think that New Yorker review because um, Dick Carpenter hand drew all those maps in in all those different volumes of uh, those railroad atlases, which Johns Hopkins uh, was more than a little skeptical that that could possibly happen um, when the reviewer in the New Yorker was actually told that fact. Um, he he just he, he remarked he goes, "This is the type of project that a gang of monks would have reviewed and rejected." <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a wonderful series, really artistic. Uh, Garth, I wanted to go back to the 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 notion of um, uh, the the interdisciplinary nature of the urban studies program. If I understood yeah. what yeah. you were saying uh, correctly, uh, the, the fellowship uh, student fellowship program that you are running, right, uh, is is 
deliberately it's a, it's a program that provides a, a stipend to two rising seniors every year and a corresponding stipend to two faculty advisors that advise um, uh, rising seniors to produce do research and produce publishable articles right. in the in fields relating to urban studies but the critical component of that program i think is the fact that um recipients of the award do not have to be uh, urban studies majors at all that's right and the idea was to uh, get people who do mathematics and are doing or do history or uh architecture or whatever right. uh to take an interest in how their field relates to the urban studies field and urban studies environment yeah because as you know i i, I believe very strongly that the cities are made up of all kinds of things and all kinds of people with different perspectives and skills and so forth need to be involved in urban planning ultimately uh, but the the catalyst for sort of uh, energizing people who will work in the urban studies field, even if not urban planners, has got to be an interest in how their fields relate to the urban environment. So if you're a mathematician or computer scientist, so you have to understand how that can that can play a significant role in the way in which urban planners go about their planning activities. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, the 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 fellowship uh, stand that that uh, you and and Rosemary have uh, put in place for us, and it's just been an extraordinary um, generosity from you, uh, has created now uh, four projects thus far: two last year and and two this this year. Um, you could say, on the one hand, three of the four um, have been urban studies majors, but all four have been double majors. And so um, we have majors represented from economics, political science, international studies, and environmental science um, so far. And the emphases in all four of those projects have been interdisciplinary. So they're looking at uh, urban studies, of course, because that's the whole point but they're coming at it from uh, an environmental perspective, from uh, an environmental science perspective, coming at it from a, a sort of global, a study of global diasporas in international studies, um, looking at um, the politics of, of planning a new port um, in, in the case of, uh, of one of our students last year, um, and looking at the city itself of, of Hartford and, and community relations. So we've had very diverse projects thus far, and I hope that that will continue. I hope we'll continue to uh, to build that interdisciplinary connections. And I look forward to having applicants coming in the next couple of weeks and, and hopefully having some of them be from students that are not in uh, urban studies at all um, to, to, um, to build the kind of connections you're talking about. Um, because I think that's, that's got to be a goal um, part of my idea with the fellowship too, and we're 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 seeing if it will work and 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 experimenting with it is is to to build towards uh, publications. Part of that is to help with uh, the publications for for faculty members that they can publish with their students. It's very common in the natural sciences uh, and math at Trinity and computer science. It's not very common. Um, in, in the social sciences, and it's very rare in, in urban studies um, to have our, our students publishing with our faculty. So this is a way to kind of build that. Um, and we'll see how it works because it is a, a challenge when you're dealing with a senior who's gonna go off into wherever they're going to go off to, and uh, they've got to produce something by the time they graduate that's publishable. And then the question is, and and so far we're two for two in that regard, um, but then to get it published uh, is is another step that maybe takes uh, takes a little bit longer than they're willing to put into it. We'll have to see. Um, well, you know, even if even if they they don't get it published, the discipline of writing as if it were to be published is, is a vastly different thing, I think, from what 
students ordinarily do by way of a senior thesis, for example. That's right. And I think we want to look to ways that we can we can operationalize this idea uh, to to get uh, to get the work that our students do to a broader audience. That maybe that isn't in some obscure um, specialized academic journal. It might be in some other kind of of outlet. Um, and we have to kind of explore uh, how to do that. We'll talk some more about that tomorrow, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. To circle back to the, the the central question that is is the theme of of this uh, discussion, Trinity as a powerhouse is that the right way to look at urban studies? Do, is it is it a competition or is it something that is unique to is it Trinity unique in this regard in doing what it does? It's never going to compete with Harvard in the right. school of design and so forth, right? Uh, right. It's not going to compete with Penn, but why? Why should it? It seems right. to me there's something very special about being um, um, part of a Trinity liberal arts program, being part of a of a, a, a smaller community with many very diverse interests. Uh, I agree, and and I, and I think we're you know we're small, so we can't really do uh, we can't cover absolutely everything that every topic. Um, is required to do and every big school is going to be able to do a place with you know 27 faculty members in urban planning and they're, they're going to have a much broader array of of, of subjects uh, for students to take um, so we have to do well with uh, with what we have and we have to continue to grow um, in terms of the number of faculty we're going to have a search next year for a new faculty member um, but we also have to uh, stay within our limits. And that means maybe, you know, powerhouse or not, the most important thing is that we are, our power is contained within our house. <laughs> and we don't get our, you know, as the, the old saying goes, you don't get uh, uh, out in front of our skis. Um, you know, and I think that is, um, we were, we were edging towards that. Um, I always like the metaphor of, um, uh, it's a cartoon, and I think it was Wiley Coyote. I don't remember exactly which cartoon. I remember as a kid, uh, and he's riding a train, and he's running out of track. The train's going so fast, and he pulls out the Acme bag of tracks, and he's just throwing tracks down in front of the train as the train's going flying forward. And I think we were at that point a couple of years ago in urban studies. We just needed to sort of step back. Let's do this properly. <laughs> And and let's have our terrain tracks ready for for the growth that we're going to have. Um, I think the other challenge that we have is that you know we are in this uh, it's a strength and it's an opportunity for us, but it is also a challenge that we are in the Center for Urban and Global Studies, and part of what we have uh, is our relationship with Hartford, but we also have a very global uh, faculty with connections uh, around the world. And Trinity has this long tradition of, uh, of study away and programs in other countries that we want to build on. So one of our, our Marcus fellows, uh, Rory Trani will be talking tomorrow, um, went on study abroad to Copenhagen and, uh, Denmark has always been a, you know, sort of leading place for urban design, uh, and sustainable urban development. Um, and we've had a run of students who've gone to Copenhagen on study abroad, uh, and studied, urban design, urban planning, urban transportation, um, and they bring that back. And so we build on that connection. And that's part of why I called that class, the new classic global studio, because it's not, it's not Hartford studio. Uh, we have the liberal arts action lab. We have that uh, for undergraduates uh, to work with the city of Hartford. So we can build beyond that to, to looking at issues in the world, but it's a big world. And we can't cover 169 towns in Connecticut. How are we going to cover, you know, 200 some countries in the world? It's not not going to well, happen. Well, and Garth, that prompts a question from Susan uh, Granger Tyler. Uh, in the urban studies program, uh, is it also looking at climate connectivity with the sciences, especially medical delivery and equity in response to um, urban uh, challenges uh, in underserved communities? Yes, both of those both of those aspects are part of our our curriculum. We have a class called Sustainable Urban Development. Uh, we just had a new class uh, 
uh, approved by uh, the curriculum committee that will be offered next uh, spring by uh, Professor Shoshana Goldstein on uh, climate justice. And um, so we look at the, the, the range of issues. It's impossible uh, to look at uh, issues in, um, in cities anywhere in the world and not uh, contemplate um, climate issues and the climate emergency. Oh. Um, we, had a, we had a grant through the uh, Hartford Consortium for Higher Education with the University of Hartford and, um, and the University of Connecticut that was we were forced to cancel it because of the pandemic. Um, we got the award in, in the beginning of 2020 and then uh, were never able to, to hold the event. Uh, mm -hmm. But the focus of the event was um, uh, planning for climate change um, in Connecticut cities. Mm -hmm. And so we, we've constantly had that and it covers um, a, a lot of our courses. Um, and we've, we've really tried to, I was one of the leading voices within our uh, climate emergency committee, trying to see how we can, um, as a faculty, as a whole at Trinity, uh, address the climate crisis in the world. And urban studies is, is really, um, has to be at the forefront of that. Um, mm -hmm. And in terms of, of, of health issues, they, they go together because when you look at um, um, environmental justice and climate justice in Hartford as a city, a lot of it has to do with um, the increasing um, unpredictability and, and veracity of storms that have led to um, severity of flooding, um, particularly in, in the poorest parts of Hartford. Um, where you have a lot of absentee landlords who aren't taking care of those buildings. And so oh. there's a lot of, of issues that uh, relate to health that come from, from the, the presence of standing water and uh, dirty water in a lot of cases. Um, so it, it, it all kind of plays together. I hope I answered yeah, that. That, that brings me question. back. Yeah, that brings me back to Hartford. So yeah. Trinity's in Hartford. Um, Trinity in a lot of its promotional materials uh, touts the fact that uh, the Trinity is in Hartford. Right. Uh, Trinity could or should be a laboratory for urban studies. Right. And I'm wondering, and, 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 and Hartford is a, is, a, is a distressed city. We'd all have to admit uh, uh, homelessness and crime and the tax rate and the the challenge of surrounding the suburbs that are wealthy and don't want to be apart, don't want to share any of the burdens of Hartford. So focusing on that just for a second, what, how does the urban studies program actually work in relation to Hartford? Is mm -hmm. it actually uh, taking on projects or is it doing studies? Does it work with the, with the city council? Does it work with the state legislature? What, what concretely is actually happening? It's a, it's a good question. You know, in 2018, uh, Trinity created the Center for Hartford Engagement and Research, and we shared the building with with Share. And when they first created, I, I had to say, you know, so what are we now? Sunny, you know, if if the acronym is S is C H E R. Um, uh, so Cugs and Share share the building, and um, uh, Share has uh, within it the community uh, learning program. Uh, the Office of Community Learning and um, the Liberal Arts Action Lab, which was also started in, in 2018, and, um, and a number of other uh, Office of Community um, uh, Service as well, um, and Trinfo Cafe. So I don't, I don't want to step on their toes because they're, they're actively involved with um, many community partners in the city uh, doing research and doing uh, community-engaged uh, teaching as well. Um, so we try to be uh, mindful of the fact that um, there's no need for uh, overlap uh, in that regard. Um, that being said, we've always taught uh, from Hartford outwards. And so when I teach the Introduction to Urban Studies, I have a set of required engagements that students have to do. And these are baby steps. Um, and as you know, as you said, Trinity is you know in Hartford, and Hartford is a distressed city, and arguably the most distressed part of the city of Hartford is right in our neighborhood, and so um, it's a it's a it's a learning experience um, to ride the bus, to walk the streets of Hartford, um, to go to a, a local market or local um, 
a bodega, go to a, a local uh, restaurant that is not a, you know, a chain or a pizza place um, and experience uh, the city of Hartford. Uh, and I require the students to, to, to do that. Uh, beyond that, though, there are a lot of our students who then um, use Hartford as as a laboratory, whether it's in the classes in, in the liberal arts action lab or in in um, in share, but it is also in our classes. We have a, a class that we've offered that's called Learning from Hartford. And uh, the initial version of that class uh, was built out of the connections to the Hartford Land Bank. And uh, Professor uh, Laura Delgado has worked with them in her um, class on, uh, on uh, community development. Um, and the director of the Hartford Land Bank just became the mayor of Hartford, um, uh, Arun and Aralampan. So we have, you know, these connections to Hartford in urban studies as well as as through through share. Um, and then a lot of students do their capstone projects in the urban studies major, focused on Hartford or using Hartford in a comparative lens, um, and that can be quite enlightening to see Hartford in comparison to. Uh, sort of surprising or unpredictable um, connections. It's not just Hartford and Providence, you know, or uh, Hartford and Boston. It could be Hartford and uh, Chicago or Hartford and um, and Zanzibar, as I've done in, in my right. research. Yeah, this, this may seem like an unfair question, but, but staying with Hartford for a moment. Yeah. It, it seems to me a city like Hartford that is has lost much of it, if not all of its industrial base, has lost its headquarters status for the insurance industry. Um, a city that has no real, as far as I can tell at least, prospect for a major infusion of economic activity of any sort. How does a city like that, that is in decline and doesn't seem to have any real prospect for an economic turnaround, as to say, a, a business interest that would generate jobs and income and, and excitement and young people who want to live here and all the rest. How does a city like that think about its future? I mean, does it go Greenfield, for example, and say, all right, it, we were big once, we were important once. Mark Twain said it was the most beautiful city in, in the United States when, when he lived here and so forth. But at some point, should the city just give up and say, okay, that was then, and this is now. And what made us great then will never never uh, materialize again in the future. And we just sort of th should think about ourselves entirely differently from uh, what the glories were in the past. Well, uh, that's a very complicated question. I would probably ask Arunan <laughs> to answer it, our, our mayor. Um, but I would say... You know, I've studied most of my career. I study cities in Africa. That's my focus on urban planning in East Africa in particular. And um, when I have interviewed planners in, in Dar es Salaam or Nairobi or Dodoma or, or Zanzibar or Lusaka, um, those are cities now where you have projects going on with a lot of money behind them from the World Bank, from Russian corporations, from Chinese investors to build entirely new cities, satellite mm -hmm. towns. Um, and one planner actually said to me, um, it's as if we close our eyes as we're going out to the, you know, to the new satellite city that they're building. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a controversial subject within African urban studies. Um, but that's what's happened is that you have you have cities that uh, whose leaders have said, forget it, you know, it's it's Lagos is a wreck. Let's just build a whole new place called Echo Atlantic and all the rich can live in Echo Atlantic and ignore the 20 million people suffering next door in 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 Lagos. So I don't want to see anything like that ever mm -hmm. happen in Hartford. So in some ways, that is what happened in Hartford, because you have the growth of the suburbs uh, fueled by, you know, uh, the uh, home loans that were issued beginning in the Roosevelt administration that were heavily biased towards whites, um, the redlining practices that that led to people being trapped in in the city. Um, so I so think we have to go back and go to the World Bank. 
<laughs> I, you know, I don't want to go to the World, the World Bank. What I, what I want to see is, I, I want to see, you know, a practical solution that is not, uh, that is not trying to, to bring back the, the Hartford of the 1870s that was the center of everything in the world. I come from Scranton, Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania, and I've uh, been writing about it. And it's, it's, it's a very similar kind of story in a lot of respects. Um, and, you know, in the last uh, uh, two presidential elections, you have uh, a candidates uh, with big billboards saying, you know, Trump digs coal uh, and we're going to bring back coal. And I, I saw the mine fires in my childhood. I saw those mines flooded. There's no way that it's ever going to happen. Uh, but, you know, somehow the nostalgia of, you know, bringing back coal and in the, in the Hartford case would be, you know, let's bring back, um, you know, the, the, the classic is let's bring back the whalers, you know, and that'll change everything if we, we get an NHL team back. Um, I think that, that Mayor Bronin and now uh, uh, Mayor Arunin have, have been building on what's happening in a lot of smaller cities that have experienced deindustrialization like Hartford uh, is to bring people back and and to build on on, on real estate development um, to do so in a careful way so that it's not just gentrification and displacement if you remember our workshop that we had Stan from four years ago um, but it's is is bringing a wide range of people together um, and although it's not something that is going to completely transform the entire city of Hartford. I think when when I look at Hartford, I see uh, what's happening in the neighborhood of Parkville, and um, over the last few years, um, in particular, around uh, what's called the Parkville Market, which is um, a food court inspired by a lot of the places uh, in bigger cities like uh, like Philadelphia or, or or New York that that have these sorts of fancy food courts. Um, and it's a it's a local developer who's who's created that Carlos Moda, who's uh, Portuguese, but he's he's African uh, as well, and um, has built the the food court uh, by inviting businesses from the area in. And so it's an incredibly diverse experience to go into the Parkville Market. Uh, it's not just rich white people from the suburbs that uh, want a taste of the world in Hartford. There right. there are a lot of people who live in the neighborhood. Uh, who who come to eat in in the restaurants that represent the rep, the, the the people who live in in that area? Yeah, I, um, I mean, I I think that's very interesting. But but Garth, it's pretty it's pretty small, right? It's and, small. But and, what I was going to say, Stan, is you have yeah. you have housing now being developed yeah. around there, and you have Stanley Black and Decker investing in an innovation headquarters in that area, and mm -hmm. so you're going to have more and more people living there. It's it's diversity has to be continued, has to be you know strengthened rather than having this this pathway to to displacement um, and and um, bring rich white people in and and kick everybody else out, which is so often right. the pattern of of of. Well, I mean, it really is. You know, the work I did at the Kennedy School, I I looked at urban renewal in Washington D.C. in yeah. in two different environments. One is the area that was devastated by the riots in '68. And then the first urban rural project in the country in the southwest segment of, of DC. And in and I looked at the social and economic uh, consequences of, of the redevelopment that occurred. And in both instances, one area was redeveloped essentially by the government, and the other area area developed by the private sector by and large. And in both instances, you saw the same kind of gentrification. You know, the, the blacks were displaced, the poor were displaced, right. the rich came in. But it's almost unstoppable in a way because the economics just drive that. It's it's what brings uh, the money in. It's what attracts developers. And I talked to a number of developers in connection with that work. They all had these sort of tipping points in in their sort of calculus, and there had to be enough people with enough money uh, to make it attractive to developers. And when they would come in, they would cater to those people. And that inevitably produced higher rents and higher costs and so forth. It's well, almost, we, we, almost we see a lot of that major governmental in, intervention. Well, we see a lot of that in the state of Connecticut, where you know there's a there's a code that says you every town is supposed to have ten percent of its housing be af uh, affordable, 
And we all know what what's a, a listed a supposedly affordable in a place like Greenwich is quite different than what's affordable in, in Hartford. Um, but there's a lot of affordable housing in a lot of big cities and um, other towns that have maybe 3%, 2% uh, affordable. Um, and part of what we're able to do in the urban studies program in that, for example, in that class in the global studio is have, you know, folks from Ridgefield come who want very much to have Ridgefield reach that 10% level. But there are real challenges when you don't have enough of a sewerage system uh, to build uh, high density into, into a neighborhood. Um, you know, the, the practicalities of it uh, are, are issues that we can, we can address um, and, um, and spur on, for example, in that case, having uh, the desegregate CT um, community uh, meet with Ridgefield um, to have a conversation about how do we do this? How can we desegregate? Um, how can we um, reach the goals of affordable housing in a place uh, like Ridgefield? You know, so no, I think um, Garth, there's, we're not going to solve uh, these problems, but we, you know, as a liberal arts college, we can, we can, we can spur on conversations that wouldn't happen otherwise. Yeah. No. And then um, we're getting close on, <clears throat> excuse me, time, but we do have just, uh, Philippe has a couple of questions for us. Mm -hmm. um, can you recommend a history of Hartford and can Hartford take advantage of coastal cities in the Northeast being challenged by rising sea levels? <laughs> That's a good question. Um you know, there, there are pieces that have been written about Hartford, and there's a, a great book that uh, our colleagues here put together um, from a conference that happened before I came here um, that is uh, edited by uh, Xiaoming Chen with um, his uh, student Nick Bacon. It was published in 2013 um, about legacy cities, but it's, it's largely about Hartford. Um, and I think that's probably the best uh, recent source in terms of, of Hartford. There are a couple of... And so of, who is that author again, Garth? Um, uh, Xiangming Chen is the is the lead author, um, but there are a couple of students who are in the process of creating not Trinity students um, uh, of creating a very you know important history of Hartford and most prominently Elena Rosario who is a, a Hartford uh, born and bred resident um, who is a, a finishing her PhD right now at the University of Michigan and I hope her book will will come out and change uh, the understanding of the Puerto Rican community of Hartford. Um, I, I would say uh, we're not going to be able to really take advantage uh, over the, the, the coastal cities because we're so linked. It's, it's hard to say where Hartford begins and ends um, because, you know, as a metropolitan statistical area, Hartford includes uh, the towns at the mouth of the Connecticut River. It goes all the way down to the mm -hmm. sound. Um, and Hartford was classed from its beginnings, you know, the insurance industry that had its headquarters for so many years in Hartford in, in this country, the insurance capital, um, that insurance industry, the first policies, the big burst of growth was ocean and marine insurance because Hartford was classed as an ocean port because this is a tidal yeah. river and and you could take ships from the uh from the mouth of the river all the way up to Hartford there were some 200 huh. ocean going vessels that landed in Hartford every year um, well there was there so was a... we're going to have we're going to have this connection and 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 the flooding that you see in 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 the Hartford area is going to get worse so it, it, climate change is not a problem for just the the places on the coast i think it's going to be hmm. You know, just think about this 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 winter and the last few winters. I've lived here for for thirteen years. Um, the storms we've had over the last couple of weeks, even ten to fifteen years ago, would have been snowstorms, and mm. instead it's thirty seven and it's raining, and mm. that's climate change. You know, yeah. um, and that's well, just well, 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 well the, the coast will come to Hartford. Probably. That's true. <laughs> this will become a beach town. Sure. Yeah. All right. Um, Great. Well, listen, um, we're a uh, little past our time, but thank you very much, um, Garth and thank Stan. Uh, wonderful discussion. Uh, and it certainly shows that, um, you know, I think in from the title is uh, Trinity and Urban Studies Powerhouse. Um, certainly, uh, it, if not yet, it is certainly emerging um, and the uh, critical issues 
um, that are facing, um, you know, cities, not just Hartford, but around the world. Uh, you know, uh, Garth, your center is very well positioned to um, help engage. Uh, and uh, as you say, not necessarily solve, but certainly um, do what is necessary to bring the attention to the right issues uh, on the path to a solution. So thank you both for that. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Sue. Thank you, Stan, Garth, and Matt. Wonderful discussion. Thank you for your time and for your expertise. Fellow Bantams, alumni, students, and friends, on behalf of the TCOH, thank you for spending your evening with us. Be well.